So, yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the German Film Museum. My name is Björn Schmidt. I'm responsible for the program you're going to see. And um, I have the really great, great honor to, to introduce Lev Diaz today to the screening of The Woman Who Left. And um, yeah, um, not only Lev Diaz will be there for, for a quick Q&A after the screening, but also his assistant director, Hazel Lorenzo. She's also an actress, um, regular actress at Love's Films and also subtitle maker, casting director, and <laughs> like she's doing a lot. And also there will be um, Jose Paolo Diaz, he's the production designer of the last three films Love made. So yeah, it's a really uh, great honor to have you guys here and please welcome them to the stage. <laughs> Uh, thank you for coming. I also would like to acknowledge the presence of two of my regular actors here, D.M. Swongaling and Roger Sorazzo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, it's cold. Um, I don't, you know, it's, it's, the, the weather is nasty outside, you know, so you can sleep while, you know, watching the film. <laughs> so let's have a quick and good discourse after the film. Thank you so much, yeah. So yeah, uh, thank you again for coming, Lev. Yeah. And um, maybe we start the discussion about the film mm. by talking about uh, like the setting of the film, because it's set in 1979. 79. Yeah. And many films of you. 97. Uh, 1997, <laughs> right? <laughs> and many films go back into Filipino history. Mm. And so I think it's interesting for the audience to know a bit about the cultural context. And um, yes. yeah, because we hear some some things in the radio bo broadcast, yeah. like apocalyptic visions of the <laughs> Philippines. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the, the narrative, the narration that you read and you, you heard at the very beginning of the film is about the epoch. Yeah. It's about 1997. Hong Kong was given back to China. Mother Teresa died. Princess Diana died. Uh, Versace was murdered by a Filipino, and the Philippines was at, at a very, very, you know, dire condition then. Kidnapping was at its utmost, and, you know, it's very dark. It's a very, very complex epoch, 1997. And it was also the year that I went back to the country. I was working in New York for five years as a journalist. And as uh, you know, uh, as a bum, <laughs> I was hanging out and trying to make films in New York. So. Um, yeah, maybe also adding to that, um, although it's in 1997, it also feels really contemporary, like the the environments oh, and yeah. all. So, could you relate it also to to like modern times? Oh yeah, the yeah. Like uh, the any any epoch in in our history in humans uh, in the humanity's struggle. It's the same. You can relate to it. It's we're living in a vicious cycle anyway. You know we don't, you know we don't uh, take stock of what happened in the past. We commit the mistakes of the past. So you know the past is the present. The future becomes the now always. That's like cinema. Mm. Okay. So um, <laughs> um, maybe another thing is uh, like the the main actors. Especially mm. Charo Santos and Charo. John Cruz. so um, they are really popular in the Philippines. Yeah. And John Lloyd Cruz, the guy who played the, the transgender, is one of the most familiar faces in Philippine cinema or in Filipino culture the last twenty years. He's a superstar, but he's a very very earnest actor, very good actor. Charo Santos is like an icon for the last forty years. She started great when she was young. She was part of the great cinema then. She made the great films with the, one of her masters, Mike DeLeon, you know, and she quit and she started working with the biggest network in the country until she became president of the network. And then I had a chance to talk to her. If she's still interested with the acting, and she said, yes, if there's some material. And I gave her the short story of Tolstoy, God is the truth, but waits, and she likes it. And so we'll, some, we'll make some adaptation of that. 
and we went to her hometown, the island of Mindoro, and we did the work in 22 days. Yeah. So um, maybe and to add that, uh, to add to that, um, maybe it's also for you, Hazel. Had they problems adapting to your to love style, or mm. because they were used to mainstream television or mainstream filmmaking, mm -hmm. like for them as actors? Um, uh, before, because um, the meeting of love and um, Charo, the first meeting, where um, love asked Charo if. Um, she wants to go back to acting. That was March 1, 2016. And then by middle of March, there's already uh, funding. And then April, we're doing pre-production while Love is in New York. And by May, we are already shooting. But during the pre-production, I, I was closely coordinating with the secretary of Charo. And we're already... Um, uh, warning, warning them that uh, you know that the love, love DS style. We don't have a big crew. We don't have tents. We don't have you know um, water boys, utility men. To uh, I mean, um, is it okay? And they said, no, no, it's okay. We we will we'll just go with your flow. Uh, so yeah, we didn't have any problem having Charo and John Lloyd with us. They they didn't have outrageous um, demands yeah they just yeah, they just or, uh, ordinary people sharing their craft yeah they, they eat with us if you're sitting on the floor they're also sitting on the floor yeah <laughs> and John Lloyd when we paid him he gave back the check to help us yeah, to yeah. accept the payment she's quite generous yeah. That's nice. mm. um, maybe also about um, those two in your film, what mm. kind of effects does it have to have them in the film? Well, it's, it's a way of telling them that, you know, you're, you're, you're like, in a culture like the Philippines, we need people like you. I told them to help, to propagate some things like this, like, you know, your familiar faces in the country. And, you know, I'm, I'm such an obscure figure my works, they're more known, known outside of the country. Maybe if you come, then it will help propagate these things to our people. And they understood that, yeah. Okay, so maybe you it's also... It's a matter of responsibility, I told them, too. You know, <laughs> you, 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 please be involved, be engaged, yeah. Like to take a stand for... Yeah, yeah. yeah be part of it, yeah. yeah. And um, maybe also to reach a new audience or to... to reach, Precisely, yeah. that's the okay. point, yeah. yeah. So um, maybe to introduce Popo to the discussion, um, she's the production, the designer. production designer, right? Yeah. <laughs> For the last, with a beauty queen of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. So maybe you could uh, explain to the audience how do you how you and Laugh met, and um, maybe what's when when is the, when do you start working with Laugh, like from the script or much later on? So yeah, um, I start. I, I met Love on a different film project. Um, and then after that, uh, my first work with him is the eight-hour film Lullaby for a Sorrowful Mystery. And after that, this is, so this is my second uh, film with him. Um, so it takes uh, well, I think it's the first time when I, when we did the uh, lullaby. Um, that was a uh, I mean adjusting and um, starting or establishing the relationship with with him and how he collaborates with with the production designer. Um, so by by this film, um, the woman who left, um, I already know how to I mean deal with all the requirements, all that um, he wants for a scene. So it's much easier when we did uh, the woman who left. Okay, so maybe there are already some questions or remarks from, from the audience. Your questions. If so, kindly raise your hand. Uh, Joel Sarazzo and them, so they're actors. We can ask questions also <laughs> to them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. Right. Hello. Um, early on, you mentioned already that you based it on the story by Tolstoy. Yeah. We saw another film of yours, uh, which was based on uh, Dostoevsky's uh, Crime and Punishment. Yeah. And um, first of all, uh, what's it that uh, always fascinates you about Russian literature? And what are um, basic themes which you find in, uh, in your films, uh, which lends itself? Well, the Russian collection is that I grew up, you know, having all those things. It's quite a fixation because uh, my father was into Russian literature, anything Russian. Even my name is Russian La Frente. I was named after La Frente Beria, the mass murderer, one of the yeah. mass murderers of Russia. <laughs> the right hand man of uh, Stalin was La Frente Beria. So I, my mother, my father was a socialist and he was into Russian things. So, you know, when I asked him, why did you name me La Frente? He's a very dark figure. He said, no, no, La Frente is not La Frente Beria. It's, it's a beautiful name. It's a lion, it's light. It's Slavic for lion, he said. It's a beautiful name. So I said, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> <See for you. laughs> yeah. There's the fixation. But I love Russian literature. I started reading Russian literature in college, and I discovered, of course, the usual suspects, Dostoevsky, you know, yeah. Chekhov, Tolstoy, now Platonov, all those guys, yeah. I, Russian liter literature has that, you know, a deep humanity, deep spirituality, with Tolstoy, you know, there's a lot of spaces, nuances, with Dostoevsky, you can, you know, you can mix all those, psychology to psychiatry to all the little things, you know. So, you know, it informs my, my works. My films are very novelistic. It has all those spaces, you know, nuances that you don't see. Some curiosities, curiosities here and there. So, yeah, they they inspire me. The Russian works. Yeah. Thank you. When I saw your film with uh, all the long shots, uh, with people, uh, largely pe people working or do, uh, doing d uh, daily routines, I had to think of a Russian film, uh, Andrei Rublev by uh, Tarkovsky. Tarkovsky, yeah. Um, it uh, rem remembered me to that film and uh, that Ta uh, Tarkovsky said in an interview that uh, when he shot uh, Andrei uh, Rublev, He uh, wanted to show to the audi uh, to his uh, the audience uh, the whole Russian soul. So my question is, uh, do you want to show the whole Filipinian soul uh, to the um, in, in, in your films? Yeah, d doing, doing, doing cinema is all about you know nurturing the soul. Doing art is all about that. Aesthetic is all about nurturing the soul. I love Andrei Tarkovsky. Andrei Rolev is, is a mammoth work. Every time I watch that film, it's like, how did he, how did he do it? <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's a great work. Yeah. Um. I um, appreciated the long shots, actually. I was waiting for films taking long shots. Usually I watch films of, foreigns, of foreigners taking long shots so I could, I could come up with my own ideas of what happens. Mm. I'm not pushed into whatever uh, the filmmaker wants because I've got the space to think about maybe he wanted this, maybe he wanted that, and I can even come up with my own thoughts, yes. which I like. So that gives me a freedom of watching That's them. precisely the point, you know. I, I don't want to manipulate it. I just want to be the observer like you. I, w I just want to be part of it. There's but, no manipulation. Yeah, uh -huh. but still, it was all played. Yes, there's still So that. actually, there was one guy, yeah. probably you, who told the actors to move. Yeah, I made a film, so of my, course. My, my <laughs> question is... <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, right. My yeah. question is, what's your... Um, What do you tell as a director to the actors? 
That's one question I have. How do you guide them? I, the, other, the other question is I have is, how do you cut the things? Um, mm. You take a lot of um, cure in the images and how they are, how the, how the light comes mm. and what you see, what you don't see and when mm. you see it. But cutting is another way of, of, of playing with light. Uh, that's the mm. part I didn't understand. So well, I, have to, I have these two questions. For the first question, is, it's very instructional. I don't, I don't really di direct the film. So I don't impose. It's a matter of you know, understanding, you know, uh, uh, trusting your actors. I treat my actors as intelligent beings. They do understand their characters. They can work on it. And when we're working on a scene, I know that they're putting their souls in it and they're doing all, you know, the usual work of actors. So for pure instructions, I show them the frame. You move here, you sit here, you walk here, you come in after 50 counts. It's pure instructions anyway, yeah. And for the lights, it's very intuitive. You know, the Kira screws come anyway because with this film, I didn't use any light at all. Just two scenes at night. It's, you know, what comes naturally. You know, we catch them naturally. So it's a matter of understanding light. You know, cinema is light. One big factor in cinema is, you know, light. Uh, it's a sad republic. We have a motherfucking president right now. So, <laughs> so it's just uh, destroying everything. The new normal is irrationality. You know, the new normal is misogynism. The new normal is, uh, you know, destroying all the good institutions that we have. So we'll have to fight him anyway. He will soon, you know, be disposed of. I'm very sure of that. <laughs> we can't get rid of him, you know. We'll just have, you know, to fight him. That's why part of the engagement is cinema. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Thanks very much for all your films, and I don't understand why you didn't get a prize at the Berlin Art. No, <laughs> but, but besides of it's, that, it's a competition, so you know. <laughs> but, but they make sometimes stupid decisions. It's I'm part sorry. of the fun. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. but in any case, um, uh, I wanted to ask you about the cinematography in terms of uh, this time, the decision again to do black and white. Maybe mm. you can say something about this because in North. I just example, I just love black and white. It's uh, I'm fixated to black and white. I, I grew up watching a lot of black and white. So, but why in North, for example, not black and white? North is a big decision. Uh, it's supposed to be black and white, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> we were doing we were doing the pre-productions, a lot of location hands, and then when we got to the north, which is Ilocos, that's where Marcos grew up. Uh, one of the producers toyed with that idea. You know, maybe you can go back to color. It's a good you know thing for this film. At first, I resented it, but then. After a few days of doing the locations in the the, the province is Ilocos Norte, that's where Marcos grew up, and the, that province is so beautiful, the hues, the colors, the climate, just there's a lot of you know, it's just there. So a few days before the shoot, I, I decided that that I want to do it in color. It's an aesthetic de decision. At the same time, I'm very ambivalent, of course, about it. But when we did the film, it's okay. It worked anyway. Yeah. And, and my second question is referring mm. to the pamphlet here by the German distributor. At the end, you're quoted saying something like, um, yes, we have to accept fate. Um, we have to stand fate, so to speak. So mm. maybe this was a misquotation and also what you said in the beginning. I said that? Yeah, I wonder. I wonder. <laughs> because I for drunk, me, it doesn't make know. sense in terms of... <laughs> but, uh, yeah, fate, fate is something that's it's part of our being here, you know? Like like now, we don't know what's going to happen next when we get out of this door. Yeah, but isn't it, I mean, the way, and, and I think you rightfully criticize religion, 
yeah, which mm. always comes up with fate. And in all your yeah. films, there's always the question of TOTC, uh, of Yop, and, and so on, all this kind of stuff that comes yeah, up. You, you can be very, I mean, it's against fate. Yeah, I mean, and that's politics. I mean, politics is against fate. I mean, that's Yeah, you can be very politics. dialectic in life. You can be very scientific, everything. But just like cinema, you know, cinema, there is the unwritten code about doing cinema where you just, you don't, say everything you maintain at least some mystery to it it's the same with life there are things that we don't understand that there are things that we don't we can't comprehend so i think that's fate the things that we don't know that comes when we get out of our door or when we make love with our wife and you don't have the orgasm that's fate yeah you don't know yeah <laughs> We have to maintain that. It's the same with doing art. You have to maintain that. Don't, don't give everything. Yeah. I don't know if I'm making sense, but, you know. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for your movie. I really appreciated it. Uh, that's the first time I saw a movie of yours. Um, I just wanted to ask a question um, about the Balut seller and if there is a deeper intention uh, of yours why you didn't really name him because I, every character that had uh, an importance had a name it doesn't except have a for name him. in the film. Excuse me? We just forgot about it maybe. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, because like you, um, in the film his, his name is like... Uh, Cuba, like the, Cuba, yeah, uh, the Hans thing. Ba Cuba is uh, Malay or Filipino for Hans Bach. Yeah, I, I, yeah. yes, I know. I just we're, uh, we're in Malay, sometimes we don't use the names. We use the physicality of deformities. It's part of our culture to say, if he's blind, bulag, bulag. We call him bulag instead of Jose. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, uh, part of the culture. Yeah. The the woman called uh, the bigger woman also Taba. I mean, I taba, understand yeah, yeah. that. It's just. Um, he played an well. He plays an important role in the movie, and I just uh, I, I just asked myself why didn't he um, have like a name, for instance, like Petra or uh, Holanda or mm. um, the but, other characters. But, but Cuba is a name. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, you don't say Bakla to Holanda, right? I mean, oh, he, yeah, did, he yeah, wasn't yeah. called that way. He was called Holanda, so. But I, I, I wrote the screenplay, so. I, so there's no de no deeper intention, no deeper meaning well, uh, of the character. It's it's your film now. If you can, if you give a deeper meaning to him, then okay, I, I will do yours. that then. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Next year. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, when you go on set and um, you work on a scene, how much do you stick to your um, ideas you had in front of uh, the, uh, the scene? How much do you stick to the text? Mm. How radical um, are you in focusing on the ideas you made before? Or are you giving the actors uh, a theme and let them uh, say the text they um, it which comes right when playing uh, it's all of the above so it's, uh, understanding the locations is very important important to me so I look for the locations first and then that's when I I am able to do some narrative for you know the characters, the trajectory of the, you know, of what they want to do, and even it's 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 kind of a creating a habitat. But uh, when I I, use, I usually write this, if I'm thinking of that door for tomorrow's shoot, I wake up at dawn, I write the script, the screenplay for the screen for the screenplay for that door tomorrow. It's not. You know, it's not, uh, I'm not, I w it's very intuitive as well when I get there, and if there's some thread that's coming, coming up, and I'm, I'm open to it, yeah. 
Okay, so one one day you might have a situation, on the next day you might give the actor a text, yeah, yeah. on the next day... Every day is a discovery know. in the shoot, because it's, okay. it's evolving and evolving. There's a lot of incarnations, you know, so... How long was this? I, I'm, I'm open to all those things, so it's it's it's, it's more of a, a process of fluidity. That's what, that's my principle. I don't want to stick to what I thought like ten days ago. If it's if yeah. if a door is opening, then I'll follow it. There's something. There maybe there's something to it. It's, maybe it's more important. Yeah. So how long was the script for this movie? Oh, uh, I wrote the storyline. Uh, during the pre-production, I wrote a treatment. A treatment is just a description of the scenes, and it's incomplete during the pre-production as well. But during the shoot, that's when I wrote the screenplay. Every night I was writing the screenplay for the next day. So it's kind of evolving and evolving every day, and they were waiting every morning. <laughs> and they know my process anyway, so I trust them and they trust me. The same with the actors, they're ready to go for it. Every day they're, they're discovering their characters and they're working on it. All of us are working at the same time, yeah. So while shooting, you're still imagining yeah. for the next... Yes, yes, it's, it's still evolving and evolving. I love your style. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. It's very fluid, yeah. The actors were also shocked when when they... Yeah, when you said to them that Holanda kills Rodrigo, right? So, mm. so oh... What I'm doing that so I read that somewhere that John Lloyd Cruz was like didn't expect it to be so when you announced yeah. it on the day okay yeah it was like <laughs> always a surprise just what like Hazel said this is a surprise every day for all of us even me uh, when I'm writing writing is such a you know magical process where things are coming up so when they come up then you just be open to it so yeah it's a discovery always yeah I mean, may I just add that each day, of, um, each day when we shoot, when we receive his script, we're always reading it immediately, Popo and I, and we were like, oh, this is what will happen to the character. <laughs> oh my. We're also followers of the film because, um, mm. you know, every day each character grows and, you know, um, it's different from <coughs> the story that he, he pitched to us before we started the shoot. So even during shootings, it changes, it's evolving. Sometimes um, in between scenes that we shoot, he will write an immediate script like on the spot. And then because he has bad handwriting, I will rewrite it again and then I will give it to actors. Yeah. So we're always following, ah, okay, this is what will happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's the process. So, um, if you, if you kind of improvise the whole film during the shoot, how is it when you edit it? Do you get? Is I, it perfect, it's a different way. Difficult? It's a different way of improvisation because we have a script really every morning, every day. So I'm very, I'm very, I'm very strict also with the way it's done because I ask them to really memorize the dialogues. Uh, improvisation is more of their contribution to the character. To the scene, yeah. So editing is another matter because it's a different world. But I'm also the editor, but I put myself as the editor. So when I'm doing the post production, so that's when I put a dirty finger to the director, which is still me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> dirty finger to cinematographer. It's the world of the editor now. How do you juggle these images? How do you? You put a rhythm to it. How do you harmonize all the scenes? How do you put the rhymes? It's like you know, it's like composing music now. Where do you put the refrain? Do you where do you put the coda? Which are the verses for this film? So it's it's about that, yeah. Sometimes it's easy. You just put the things together anyway. Put things together. Putting things together. I saw your filmography. You have done so many films in the last years and also very long fi films. I think in Germany uh, there are many directors who would be happy if they would find the money to do so many films. How do you do that? <laughs> it's easy to do films in the Philippines because we don't really uh, uh, conform to the way you know film production is done in the West where they put a lot of money... Lots of investors here and there. In the Philippines, 
if you have an idea, if you have a story, just grab a cheap camera, you know, force your friends to join you, exploit them, and there's the film. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, it's, it's that, that principle, yeah. But your, your films, the camera looks really great in all your films. It's well, of course, fantastic. we put a lot of hard work. Fantastic. Of it doesn't look like <laughs> a cheap camera <laughs> yeah, yeah. at all. This was done with a really cheap camera, the Sony A7S II. It's just, uh, the Sony A7S II is just $3,000. When this film won in, again, it's <laughs> this story, I kept telling people that it's not about the camera. It's how you apply your tools. Like when it won in Venice, the Golden Lion, I was sitting with Tom Ford, with Konchalovsky, all the big guns of the, you know, cinemas and they all use these huge cameras that are so expensive 75,000 a day rent for just one big camera and this camera is just three thousand dollars so when he asked me oh which camera did you use what camera i said sony s7s2 nobody was speaking for like 30 seconds <laughs> everybody's you know, you know it's it's all about application you know. what There are, yeah, it's there are parts where you know, out of focus, but the cam the you know. Did you, did you do, to me, it, to me, it looked like you did not use out of focus, like you, you, you. No, no, it's all, it's all, it's all uh, man manual, yeah. It's manual. Yeah. There's no other focus in the It's all manual, you know. That's nice. I just use Usually I just use one it, one lens. That's nice. Usually the, the director lens. is better than the camera. <laughs> it's all about application. I appreciate man. that too. Thank, Thank you. You. Yeah. you also once said that it's important for you to to like have the camera and not land it every day, because like so you have so you 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 are able or in charge of the means of production. So yeah, it must be part of you. Camera yeah. is your eye. So even if it's just your cell phone, it's all about application. I keep telling people that you know. So, are there any other questions? <laughs> okay, yes, thank you for your mo movie. I thank have you. one question. Why, after losing her anger and uh, no longer going for revenge, well, why doesn't uh, she just go to court? Is she taking the chance by Hollanda or...? Question. Because uh, the things that I thought of when she just, I think it's the issue of forgiveness also is total to her. You know, it's like, okay, once she just forgot about the crime of this person to her, it's all about redemption now. She just want to look for the lost son. So it's another quest for her. Uh, uh, the character of Horacio for me is like hagiography. He's he's beyond humanity now. He's, he's a holy person. So going to court is just a better thing for her now. So it's all about you know looking for the sun. If she finds him or not, it's you no. Know, it's up to us now, viewers. You know, but his humanity is so complete. She's a saint in a way. My question is is concerning the relation the relation of aesthetics, strong aesthetics in your film we, mm. we have seen tonight mm. and politics mm. which makes sense to ask you personally because you're here tonight so could you point for me and the audience how you strengthen and not how but how strong you strengthen aesthetics in relation to politics uh a discourse in aesthetic especially if you're an artist is very hard because it's it's hard. There's always this decision if you want to go to a certain domain. Are you going to go for art for art's sake? Or are you going to go for aesthetic that is at least responsible to humanity? 
and I'm, I'll go for this thing because there's, ur there's an urgency to engage. There's an urgency, urgency for engagement. I'd go for an aesthetic that has responsibility, especially to my people. It's always that principle for me, yeah. It's easy to turn our backs and just create some, you know, cool cinema the way we see it, you know. Some hardcore art for art's sake. It's easy to do that, you know. Just to have fun at the MoMA or somewhere. But we have responsibilities. Our country is sinking, so we need to help. We need to share our experience, you know, as a people, our culture. Yeah. We have parallel you know, struggles anyway. So sharing this struggle now to you, I think you see something in your culture as well. Yeah. Even if I can't believe it that, that you walked through Frankfurt tonight and today, uh, what was your impression about Frankfurt? If you come to a place like that, I love like Frankfurt. That? It's my first time. <laughs> no, no, don't say, don't say, I love Frankfurt. That's too. I'm, that's too I'm, easy. I'm shooting a film about Frankfurt actually right now. So, hey, what's we're shooting it in Berlin, so it's I don't know why. <laughs> but the film that we're shooting right now, it start, it started in Frankfurt like years ago. I had this experience at the Frankfurt airport. Around 2004, 2005, I was holed up at the airport, coming from some festival. There's this blizzard, and I was holed up at the Frankfurt airport for two days. And this old Filipina befriended me. She was feeding me. She was giving me money, coffee, drinks, the whole two days. And then when it's time to go, she told me this harrowing story about what happened to her. I was just crushed. And that's the story we're shooting right now. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I have two more short questions. Yeah. Um, one is I very much like uh, that you hardly use standard kind of music in your films. Mm. Well, you have a lot of singing or sometimes just a little bit of singing and you make a big difference between, let's say, uh, regular uh, billboard kind of music and, and um, <clears throat> people singing, expressing themselves. I think this is a very, very good decision because a lot of filmmakers and a lot of theater people really abuse music. Um, <clears throat> But it also seems for me like seems to me like this is a comment to Hollywood to filmmaking in general. Yeah. So then the second point is if I look at a movie like Batang West Side, there's a scene where you make a reference to a taxi driver, where the paranoid guy shaves off his hair uh -huh. and then kills the people. And of course in Scorsese, as he's always apologetic of violence, I mean being sponsored by the mafia, he has to be. So I mean, isn't that I mean, you you might say, okay, I read this into it, and yeah. it's just your reference system and blah blah. Mm. But I think uh, I see that in a lot of your films that you try to criticize other films and filmmakers uh, very obviously. I mean, very clearly. Yeah, it's part of the discourse. I love, I have a love hate relationship with Hollywood. I love Hollywood at the same time I hate it, and especially the the issue of you know the profit motive that's behind all these works in Hollywood. It's obscene that they're working, they're making like 99% of the works just for the money, just for profit, just for the market. When we can actually use cinema to change humanity. But I love Hollywood. I've learned cinema from them. And that's the very reason why I didn't want to manipulate my works. I don't use uh, soundtrack, universal soundtracks in my films. What you cut. The diegetic sound that you hear is, you know, mostly from what the sound person or the sound machine got during the shoot. So it's a love hate relationship. I love Hollywood and I hate Hollywood, man. I'm very honest with that. <laughs> Speaking about the sound, um, I wondered when I saw your films whether the soundtrack you hear mm. is always the one that was recorded on the spot, yeah, or whether later on you mix something in. For example, if you if you hear a gecko, was it really there, or was it mixed in later? Most of the sound that they're from what we got during the shoot. We just sometimes we clean it up. We add some things. Yeah.
Okay, so if there aren't any more comments or questions, I think... Thank you. I can uh, thank you for staying and for also coming. thank you for coming. Yeah. Salamat. <laughs> Salamat. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.